Today we've got a great revenge story against some little jerks who freak around and find out. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, want to play mailbox baseball? Fine, it'll cost you one window. My sister lives in a more rural area and has recently been plagued with having her mailbox smashed in twice in one month. Someone was playing mailbox baseball and she was one of the victims. She asked for my help and was worried about staying within the law to protect herself. I told her we could figure something out, so I went to Home Depot and purchased two identical steel mailboxes, the traditional kind with the rounded top. I took one mailbox and glued a layer of 1 16th inch foam underlayment to the inside. I filled it with concrete, making sure to add the appropriate rebar with a curved handle sticking out of the end. Once everything was set, I cut off the outer mailbox shell and used a torch to burn off the foam underlayment still stuck to the concrete. What was left was a slightly undersized concrete plug that would perfectly fit in the second mailbox and that could be inserted and removed. You see, my sister is afraid of snakes. By inserting the concrete plug into the mailbox at night, it would give her the peace of mind that a snake can't get into her mailbox. I installed the second mailbox, informed my sister how the anti-snake concrete plug worked, and explained that the best time to put it in the mailbox would be at night. Strangely enough, one morning there was a mark on her new mailbox and a bunch of small glass pieces along the road. Hypothetically speaking, it was the kind of glass produced by someone swinging a baseball bat, having it bounce back off of a mailbox and smashing a car window. On a positive note, her mailbox has remained snake-free. I love the plausible deniability reeking off of this post. A lot of places actually have regulations or laws that you can't reinforce your mailbox like that, mostly because if somebody does lose control or, like, let's say somebody's brakes go out and somebody swerves, it's dangerous for them to drive headfirst into a reinforced concrete mailbox. But I swear, officer, it was just an anti-snake concrete plug. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, it would be amazing if you left a like or left a review if you're listening to my podcast. That said, our next story is, I fought a petty territorial war over an empty flight seat and won. I boarded my 14-hour flight from LA to Shanghai and settled down in 62H. There were four seats in the middle of the plane, 62E, F, G, H. My 62H is the aisle seat on the right. On my left in 62E and F sat a mother in her 50s and a son, college age. Between me and the mother, there was 62G, empty. As boarding's coming to an end in rare chirpy mood, I leaned over and said to the woman, hope the person doesn't come so we both have more elbow room. No response, while she fluffed the synthetic little pillow in the empty seat, I didn't think much of it. As soon as boarding is complete was announced, to my surprise, the woman moved to the empty seat next to me, effectively moving the elbow room from between us to between her and her son. The next thing I knew, she was pulling the upright armrest divider between us down. Still surprised, to her I said, why? More space for the both of us with it up. She obliged in silence and the armrest stayed up. Still couldn't decide how upset I should be though. Flight took off and the seatbelt sign came off. I reached for my shoes under the seat in the front. Imagine my outrage when my foot felt her foot in my area. Oh woman, I see you woke up today and chose violence. One more attempt of diplomacy. As a good Asian woman who knows the virtue of filial piety that I was, i.e. your foot is in the way, i.e. is Chinese honorific title for older women. My underlying message was, aren't you ashamed for behaving the way you do as an elder? She pretended she didn't hear me. This is war. Next I did what any red-blooded American would do. I complained to multiple flight attendants. One went to talk to her while I waited from not too far away. With that woman sitting steadily in that seat, I knew no justice was upheld. Flight attendant reported back apologetically. The passenger said she has to sit there because there's something on her rear end. Now, I failed to see the correlation between an empty seat and hemorrhoid, but the impartial judge was ineffective. I thanked the flight attendants, plural, because one intervened and the other two handed me a cup of hot water and then a cup of hot tea a much memified, futile attempt to show I care, and sat back down. At this point, I knew this street problem needed a street solution. You can't reason with someone who's willing to share, slash make up, some rear problems just to win. My attempt earlier to shame her with an honorific title felt laughable. 
I'll just put up my legs on the seat when she gets up to go to the bathroom. I thought, easy. Oh, the sweet summer child that was me. For the next 12 hours, I repeat, 12 hours, she did not drink water, did not lift up ever so slightly from the seat, nothing. She knew the consequences of getting up. She had done this before. This was not her first territorial war. I should add that she sounded perfectly normal talking to her son, a caring and pleasant mother. Early on, I heard the son say, Mom, why don't you move back over? And she went, Nah, don't worry about it. Chirpy, like my mood, before she ruined it. I tried everything to tempt her to. I got up to use the restroom, liberally. Look at this freedom that you could have. With the two cups that I got from those flight attendants, I transferred water from one to the other. Listen to this trickling water sound. While she was sound asleep, I turned on my overhead light. The bright beam just so happened to be slightly off-centered to her side. Waking her up felt good, but seriously, what was her bladder made of? Whatever it's made of wasn't turbulence proof. After 15 minutes of genuinely terrifying turbulence, which probably led to a much needed reassessment about her life choices, she got up and headed to the restroom when the plane steadied. I put my legs across the newly freed seat. The sun watched me from the other end of the row, next to a seat full of little pillows, blankets, and other accessories they got to accumulate. He said nothing. The woman returned and having seen me sitting across two seats, to my amazement, she tried to sit down on my legs while murmuring, my seat, I need to sit in my seat, to the airway above my head. This can't be happening. With the unexpected but to leg contact, I collected myself and said, i.e., shame on you, woman. You've been using this public seat for the past 12 hours. Don't you think it's now fair for me to put my feet up? Still making no eye contact, she jerked a retrieval and started rearranging those pillows and blankets next to her son. Fine, I'll make room for your feet. I'm not even feeling that well yet. I have to make room just so you can put your feet up. I replied, if your anus problem calls for two seats, you should have purchased one more. I'm afraid you didn't. As I talked, she murmured, stop, stop. And as my sentence finished, she simultaneously shouted, stop talking. Everyone turned around to look at her. Somehow I thought this development was just the funniest thing and started laughing. It's been a week since my flight and I still couldn't stop wondering how she would have escalated had I kept talking. With my legs up on 62G, I had the best two hour nap of my life. I never saw them again after the flight. I think OP definitely went about this the wrong way for far too long. The way you really get them to give in to your demands is as soon as you hear that they have a butt problem, you start being a little too vocal about it. Okay, flight attendant, thank you so much. I understand that she has a butt problem. That's why she has to sit in the second empty seat and not the first one. I hope her butt problem gets better in the second empty seat. Just, you know, mortify her. Our next story is, don't screw over my elderly parents. Back in 2004, I came home from college to find my parents' driveway ripped up and unusable. My mom was in tears because the contractor had just informed her that the price of the project had gone up to double the original quote. Gave no reason to why it would now cost double. My parents were teachers in a crappy city in a poor state, so they didn't make a lot of money. It was through careful investments and savings that they moved to upper middle class. My parents lived in a nice neighborhood in this crappy city and worked hard their whole lives and took pride in their home. It wasn't an extravagant house by any means. It was a tri-level 70s Brady Bunch house in a city of one-story adobe houses, never renovated, but well-built and well-maintained the 30 years they lived there. Contractors would often assume my parents were rich and try to squeeze them for money. So this is something we unfortunately have been dealing with my entire life. When this all happened, they were retired and on a fixed income. So projects like this were thought out and prepped for carefully. My mom was beside herself with stress about the whole situation, but managed to keep it from me when I called every Sunday. So imagine how mad I was to learn about this situation. This particular contractor went out of his way to make the driveway a disaster area, and my 70-year-old parents with mobility issues had literally been prisoners in their home for two weeks, unable to get through the construction zone. The contractor had stopped all work until the full payment was made. My parents had already paid half of the first quote. 
He had drug out a straightforward job by only having one or two workers show up whenever they felt like it, work an hour, and then leave. I had no idea while I was at school that this project had been going on for over a month. That semester at school, I had taken a legal class for my area of study and had just written a paper on contract law. Within an hour of me getting home, I had the contractor on the phone. To this day, I don't know what came over me. It was like I was possessed by a ghost of a prosecuting legal shark. I insinuated but never specifically said that I was their lawyer. I threw out legal terms and accused them of being in breach of their bid and a legally binding contract which, fortunately, had some language meant to cover their butts. Pointed to all the areas where they had violated their agreement and the obvious intentions to screw my parents. I had the contractor stuttering and stammering and promising to make the job a priority. When I got off the phone, both my parents were staring at me in shock and made the statement I made earlier that it was like I was possessed. Victory was won when the next morning at 6am, a full crew of at least 5 guys plus contractor came and finished the job in 3 hours. Contractor never asked for the revised price and not even the second half of the first price. He just did the job and left didn't leave an invoice or address to send payment. Of course, mom being mom tried to get in touch with him to make the second half of the payment and he got so freaked out that she was going to sue him, he dropped off a check for $1,000 from accounting errors and apologized profusely. Plus, he left all the extra supplies that he overpurchased and had billed my parents for. It was enough that the following year, when my father had to go from walker to wheelchair, we had enough concrete and supplies to build a ramp. Dang, that felt good. And the one thing I could do for my parents after a lifetime of them sacrificing for me made my whole college education worth it to me. Moral of this story, don't freak with the elderly and give a daughter an education, she'll defend you from the wolves. You just about can't script moments better than this where the stars align and what you're literally working for your career for is exactly what you can utilize to help save your parents. I mean, how much more awesome feeling than that does it get? Our next story is Five Rings. I have four sisters. My mom is slash always been mean and neglectful of me. Only me. I'm older now and recognize her lame attempts at making me feel less than. Taking away her power of it now makes me smile. She always tries to cut me down and keep me separated from my siblings. My mom, classic hoarder, got her claws into an elderly woman whom has no family. Mom has acquired gold, rings, etc. from this 91-year-old woman, Pat. Pat had five heirloom rings. She wanted my mom, Debbie, to give one to each of us girls since she has no family to pass things on to. There was a plan to hand out the rings to us when we were all together. Super Bowl, one of my sisters couldn't make it, so the rings weren't handed out since we weren't all there. Two weeks later, a brunch is planned for a day that I'm slammed. I have four kids to take to two separate softball practices, I coach. There's no way I can make this brunch and get four kids to practice by 10.30. They all still go to brunch. Later in our group chat, I see my mom post Pat's contact card and tell everyone to mail a thank you letter to Pat. I wrote, thank you for what? And a sis writes back, the rings. I ask why they were given out when I wasn't there. My mom hates when I show people how she treats me instead of just saying quiet. Mom responds, you should have been there. When my mom gets busted doing shady stuff to me, she never wants anyone to know, so she will always private message me and try to get me off the chat so she can bully me. Debbie wants to appear one way to groups and people, so responds to me individually so she can be mean with no one seeing it. Sure enough, I get an instant message off the thread, Debbie asking if I'm home so she can drop off whatever ring is left. Ha! No thanks, Blackheart. I'm good. Having the contact card that Debbie posted, I pick up my phone and call Pat and explain who I am. She knows I'm one of Debbie's kids, as my mom will always talk about her six kids, but people outside of my siblings don't know how I'm treated by Debbie. Pat and I chat for a while and she's a lovely, old, lonely southern woman. I tell her thank you for giving all my sisters rings, that it was very sweet. She said she was so happy to give them to us as she has no one and is getting very old. She asked about my ring, which one I chose. Here's where I told Pat everything. That I didn't get a ring, that my mom is terrible to me both growing up and now. I wanted Pat to know the truth for the next time Debbie calls her trying to act like a saint. 
Pat says she hopes she can be there for me to atone for my mother's shortcomings. I tell Pat that I'm not only okay and perfectly happy, but a minimalist and don't want anything. The only thing I wanted was to talk and say thank you. I felt so good talking to her. I jumped right back into the group chat and told everyone that I'd just gotten off the phone with Pat. You can bet the farm that Debbie's blood went cold reading that I, the mistake child, had called Pat. Debbie, rattled I'm sure, wrote back quickly in the group chat saying, Maybe you should wait to call until you have something to say. Like, wait to call her until after I have a ring to thank her for? All I responded in the group chat was, Already called. Thanks. Heart emoji. Honestly, I feel like OP should have kept digging into it. Oh, I had a nice long talk with her mom, don't you worry. Oh, I thanked her for all she did. We even had a nice long talk about you. Heart emoji. Our next story is, you want my work? Have fun. A few years ago, I worked for a firm that consulted for small businesses. Not long after I joined, the firm was acquired and the new company did some crappy things to force my boss out against her will. We will call her X. She was quickly picked up by a rival firm and subsequently began a personal vendetta to ruin us. I didn't think much of it at first, but it escalated to the point that everyone at the office knew X's name and what she was trying to do. A couple of years after X left, a new board member, we'll call him Y, came into a company I was assigned to. Y repeatedly found non-existent problems, made me put together documents that he never looked at, and constantly complained about how I was doing a terrible job. Luckily, my manager knew my work was fine and had my back, but it was cutting into my time and energy to accommodate Y. This went on for months. Finally, Y convinced the other board members of my incompetence, and they voted to fire us. Then they signed a contract with X's firm. By then, I'd heard whispers through the grapevine that Y was friendly with X and wanted the company to switch to her new firm to get us to lose business. I was ticked. Y complained about my work for months, and he wasn't quiet about it. He made it seem like it was my fault. I put so many extra hours into that stupid company trying to appease him and it turned out it didn't even matter because he and X were out to get us. I was told to prepare my files for transfer to X's firm. Oh, I'll prepare them all right. Most of my work was in Excel. I couldn't touch the important info, but I had lots of things working behind the scenes. Formulas that updated info across multiple pages, automatic calculations, meticulous double checking, All sorts of little tricks to make my work easier. Almost two years of continuous trial and error and adjustments. I deleted all of it. Whoever got the document had to manage almost 40 pages of numbers and legalese line by line. I'm sure they'll have their own system to smooth the process eventually, but it was undoubtedly massively inconvenient and time consuming for whoever had to set all that up. Petty? Probably. Satisfying? Absolutely. This is the kind of thing that I would look for automation to screw up. Look and see if there's a way that I can get like a macro that'll just change everything, screw it all up, make it just eye-bleedingly unreadable. And then you export it and save it as like a BMP file, not even like a JPEG. Enjoy your red text, yellow highlighted, 10-point font, BMP nightmare reference. Our next story is Loudon Hotel. Enjoy the alarm. Wife and I flew out early this morning from neighboring city, so we got a hotel room at a major chain. The room was okay, but when we turned out the lights to go to bed early, you could see light creeping under the adjoining door. No problem, I can close my eyes. However, the people in that room decided to go full George Costanza from 9 to 12. At 12, I called the desk and when I mentioned the room number, he asked, Are they still making noise? So others must have heard as well. We had the last room on the hall, and the rage room was second from the end. I set the bedside alarm as we were leaving. Ten minutes later, they should have had an early wake up. Now the problem here is when the George Costanza room calls and complains about the alarm blaring for lord knows how long, they're gonna be able to tell that's unoccupied, go right in and fix the problem for them, rather than not address it for everybody else. I mean, they're really there like, are they still making noise? You mean I'm not the first person to complain and you still haven't done something? 
Our next story is Petty Little Driving Incident. A couple nights ago, I was getting home late from work and decided to stop by a McDonald's by my house. There was some construction on one of the main roads and the lanes went from two to one with cones blocking it off. Some jerk decided he absolutely needed to be in front of me and almost hit my car just to cut me off. I honked at him and he hit the brakes and started to block traffic while flipping me off. No idea what his problem was, as I didn't have any interaction with him prior to this. Well, I have custom LEDs in the grill of my truck that had been installed by someone else before I bought it. I turned on my brights and then the LEDs, which hit his back windshield perfectly. He started to move forward, so I shut them off, but he was moving at a snail's pace, brake checking and swerved towards me every time I tried to pass. So, I turned all my lights back on and made sure to stay the perfect distance behind him to ensure maximum annoyance. We were on a one-way, so there was no oncoming traffic, and since he stopped, there wasn't anyone else in front of him, only he was getting it. Guess where he was headed? The same exact McDonald's that I was going to. I pulled in right after and shined my lights all the way through the drive through We were the only ones there and I turned my lights off before facing traffic coming out of the drive through After he got his food, he waited for me and started trying to follow me with his brights, but he gave up after a couple of minutes when he realized he wasn't making a difference. It was especially satisfying that literally no one but him was getting flashed. Just about anybody who hears the description of OP's truck immediately jumps to, oh my god, I hate that guy. But this is actually like the one rare time where you hear this story and you're like, you used your god-awful annoyance powers for good, big truck. Our next story is Petty Revenge Gone Bad. I live in an area with tree-lined streets with most houses on acre lots. Very natural looking landscape. Even the mailboxes are mostly hidden from view by native vegetation. When looking down the street it looks very rural. Feels like living in the countryside, not in town. I had a new neighbor that moved in from out of state that was going to save the neighborhood by calling the city to have signs put up everywhere for everything. Children playing, watch for animals, blind corner, more speed limit signs, pedestrians on road. The signs were changing the appearance and feeling in the neighborhood. After a sign went up in front of my house, changing the rural feeling, I went for revenge. Called the city for a minor zoning violation on his property. If he was going to save the neighborhood, I was going to help. Petty revenge felt good. A week after I notified the city of violation, he suddenly dies. Now his wife has to deal with the violation and his funeral, plus all the unpleasant things of dealing with loss of lifelong partner. I feel like a jerk. Petty revenge sucks. I mean, it was a good petty revenge right up until the point where it fell on somebody that wasn't the intended target. In that situation, I understand why OP feels the way they do, but the important thing to focus on is, you never intended for that guy to die, unless you did. And this is all a pretty good cover-up. Our next story is Little Jerk Freaks Around and Finds Out. So about a year ago, my 31-year-old female, daughter Allie, 11-year-old female, made a friend with a girl down the street. Let's call her Dana, 11-year-old female. Dana's family seemed to have a few rules and boundaries, but we shrugged it off because Dana was nice. And our daughter finally had a friend on the street. One weekend, my daughter comes to me crying because Dana's friend Dylan, 9-year-old male, wanted to play with the girls in her backyard and decided to choose violence when rejected, so he roughed them up a bit. We go outside and immediately I see Dylan book it back to his street and Dana is also bawling about Dylan shaking them and hitting them. My boyfriend joins us as we escort Dana back to her house. We find out where Dylan lives and speak to his less than concerned mom about it. She didn't seem to care much. After, we wanted to let things cool down, so we kept Allie inside all week. Now, Dana's dad knocks on our door a week later and asks if Allie isn't playing down the street anymore because of Dylan, and then promises the girls will be safe and Dylan is no longer allowed to play at their house. So the next day, we let her go over to Dana's house, but she comes home early and says Dana's mom said they had to play with Dylan or Allie could go home. We did message Dana's dad and ask why he went back on his word, and he just said he told Dylan to be a good boy and he could play with them. So we decided to no longer let Allie play at Dana's house anymore. 
As the months go by, more kids move into the neighborhood and they soon make a little kid gang with Dana and Dylan as their leader. They ride in front of cars, peeing in yards, throwing things from their bikes, trespassing multiple neighbors' property, running around in the pouring rain and getting in front of cars. Dylan would mouth, freak you, and flip me off as I drove by. We did our best to ignore them. More recently, they've been hanging out at a seemingly empty house a few houses away from ours. The owner travels a lot and lives in a trailer on the side of their house. We have warned them a few times to stay off their yard. A few days ago, I was leaving to the grocery store so I had to drive by kids at the house on the corner. I was trying my best to ignore them until I saw Dylan run up to their door and run back and gives me the most petty, smug grin I've ever seen like he's daring me to do something. So I roll my window down and tell them they need to leave the house. They all scatter, Dylan first, but Dana is the last. I tell her that she needs to leave too. She says, but then just leaves like she wanted to argue that no one lived there, so why does it matter? Yesterday, the group of kids goes to the house on the corner, and they all go out throwing rocks and sticks at the windows. My boyfriend called the non-emergency police number, and apparently someone else had already called the cops on them, and the cops told the kids to leave, but the troublemakers, Dylan and his friends, stuck around despite the cops telling them to leave. So the cops drive up the street from both directions to trap them and tell Dylan and his juvie friends they're taking them all home in the back of their cop car and talking to their parents. I wish I could have returned the smug look on Dylan's face as the cop car pulled away. Hopefully they'll stay on their side of the street from now on, and hopefully Dylan will be grounded for a while. Honestly, considering the reaction of Dylan's parents when OP went over there in the first place, I don't really have much confidence that Dylan's actually going to learn from this experience. They don't have any form of responsible learning at home it sounds like, or at least not a healthy kind. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.